This video is sponsored by Captain Con, a classic gaming convention featuring a 64 player Warhammer 40k GT being held on February 3rd through 5th in Warwick, Rhode Island. More about Captain Con later on in the video. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and today we're going to be talking about lists from the new Arcs of Omen format for Warhammer 40k. The format is here in a very real way, with, with large events now using it over the old school Nephilim format. And it has changed a lot, not only in the meta, especially with data slate updates changing how a lot of mechanics in the game work, and the power level of a ton of factions, but also with how list building works. So I thought it would be fun to just go through every faction of Warhammer 40k and present a competitive list for it. These are mostly gonna be taken from events that have happened over the past couple of weekends. I'm gonna credit the event that it played in and the player in question down in the bottom corner of the video. So if you wanna go check out exactly how well the list did, then you can feel free to do that. Generally, I'm going to be taking lists that I feel are pretty representative of the current state of every faction in the game. So you can get a good idea of what to expect if you're going to be seeing these factions in a competitive event near you. Now, what I'm not going to be doing today is going through mixed faction armies or individual sub-factions in each uh, faction proper. So if you want me to talk about every Space Marine chapter or a similar list like that, I'm not going to be doing that here. But let me know down in the comment section down below if you want me to expand this into a series of videos diving a little bit more deeply. Before we get started, as always, if you like my 40k content, go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the channel, do all that YouTube stuff. You know the drill. This video took me ages to make, so any support would be greatly appreciated. Now, before jumping into the list themselves, I'm going to talk real quick about Arcs of Omen list building, since it is different than basically every other format that Warhammer 40k has used. Essentially, when constructing an Arcs of Omen list, your main faction selection is going to be in a single detachment called an Arcs of Omen detachment. This has immense flexibility, allowing you to take multiples of every battlefield role slot. In addition, the Arcs of Omen detachment allows you to pick which battlefield role is compulsory and gives you three additional options from whatever slot you choose. This means that unlike previous formats, you no longer need to take troops in your army. And if you have a particular unit or battlefield role in your army that's extremely powerful, you can spam that basically to your heart's content. Outside of troops, you can take essentially six options out of any single battlefield role slot, assuming you choose that option as your compulsory slot, but you get a little bit of extra if you are taking true. You also get up to four HQ slots. There's a stratagem to take duplicates of an HQ that would normally be restricted to one, and you get additional elite slots for taking character elite. But to throw another wrench in the works, Arcs of Omen also allows you to take allied detachments. Depending on what super faction you're using, whether that's Chaos, Imperium, or one of the Xenos factions, you have options to take a patrol or super heavy auxiliary detachment in addition to your Arcs of Omen. However, these are the only detachments available to you. You can't take any normal detachment types out of the core rulebook. This means that bringing allies in is the only way to get additional slots over what your Arcs of Omen detachment would normally allow. There's a limited selection of allies that you're allowed to take in this second detachment. I think the most common are going to be Knights or Chaos Knights for Imperium or Chaos factions. Imperium can also take a Leagues of Votan patrol as an ally, which is interesting, but doesn't actually give them uh, any ally-specific mechanics, which means that they break a lot of your faction or super faction abilities. And any of the Eldari factions can take Harlequins as a patrol as well. So that's list building in Arcs of Omen. Obviously, it gives you enormous flexibility and removes a lot of the minutia from previous versions of list building in Warhammer 40k. <laughs> Captain Con is a three-day gaming convention held in Warwick, Rhode Island, February 3rd through 5th. It is a holistic tabletop gaming convention and includes events for a vast number of tabletop games, including War Machine, Infinity, Breachstorm, Age of Sigmar, and most excitingly, Warhammer 40K. This includes a 64 player GT that will be run using all the new Arcs of Omen rules, including the new Astra Militarum Codex, which a lot of events have not been allowing yet. If you're a fan of classic gaming conventions, Captain Khan is the place for you. It has board and miniature games running 24 hours a day from the Friday of the event all the way through Sunday, and you even get points that you can use to redeem for prizes the more you participate in events, visit vendors, and just play in open play areas. They have a huge board game library to take advantage of and RPGs running throughout the entire weekend, so even if you're not on that tournament grind, there's a ton to do. 
Captain Con has been a huge part of my life ever since it launched, and I'm excited to have them on the channel as a sponsor once again. I'll be there myself working and running games for my game, Breach Storm, as well as streaming the 40K GT. So you can come swing by, hang out with me, or tune into the coverage of the event on this very YouTube channel to watch the action starting on Saturday. So get your tickets today at CaptainCon.com, and I'll see you in Rhode Island in February. So we're back to the video and it's time to finally talk about lists themselves. We're gonna start at the bottom of the list down with the unaligned Xenos factions and then moving up through the various super factions in the game. We'll start with Necrons who have seen some big transformative changes from the Nephilim season. The big one being that the normally taken Necron sub faction, which was a custom dynasty bringing relentlessly expansionist and eternal conquerors is no longer viable given that eternal conquerors has effectively been removed from the game. In its place is the Nylock dynasty, which includes the eternal Conqueror's benefit of getting objective secured on other models, but also includes some additional benefits like getting access to stratagems, warlord traits, and upgraded command protocols. So you lose that six inch pregame move, but you still get some additional benefits as well. Without the benefit of the massive scoring on turn one that Necrons could normally get, Necrons are focused a little bit more on a combined arms approach to damage output. While they do retain that army-wide objective secured, which means they love Arcs of Omen detachments, since they're no longer required to take troops options, and Necron troops have generally been very bad, so I don't think much of value has been lost there, that opens them to instead focus on units like Destroyers and Canoptic units. This list in particular has a lot of interesting combos with Canoptic units, like this Technomancer bringing a Canoptic control node in the Thrall of the Silent King to expand the aura range of that control node, which gives plus one to hit to Canoptic units. Alongside the Chronomancer and its Veil of Darkness that lets you pick up a core unit and play and deep strike it along with the Chronomancer, and comboing that with Implacable Conqueror to give reroll charges coming out of that deep strike, you can deliver some relatively powerful alpha strikes with these souped up Canoptic units. We also have the Silent King back there to benefit both ranged and melee attacks with full rerolls to hit for ranged and wounds for melee. He's gonna be guarded by a couple Scorpec Destroyer units that he makes extremely powerful, since giving them plus one to hit from my will be done, they already reroll their own ones to hit thanks to extermination protocols, and they'll get those wound rerolls from the Silent King's natural natural aura, making them incredibly lethal melee combatants. We have a couple utility units in the list like Tomb Blades and Canoptic Scarab Swarms that are being buffed by Canoptic Tomb Spiders. And we have some ranged output from not only the Silent King himself, but also Locust Destroyers with an attached Heavy Destroyer. This list isn't a huge evolution from the list that we saw previously in Nephilim, but it does give a very good example of an interesting combined arms approach to Necrons. Next up, we'll talk about Orcs. And Orcs, in my opinion, haven't changed too much from their Nephilim season. However, their place in the metagame has changed significantly, and that's largely because of a removal of Armor of Contempt. This particular orc list is still focused on the Goths sub-faction, giving the army exploding sixes in melee and plus one strength, making those Choppa-equipped boys even more powerful. And we have a lot of them, with 30 Beast Nega boys, 30 Commandos, and 30 Storm boys to run up the table under the Wah, get that advance in charge, and put immense pressure on your opponent. While most of these infantry are not objective secured, given the lack of Armor of Contempt in the meta, which means that the AP of their weapons is not being reduced by power armored enemies in factions like Adeptus Sororitas or Space Marines, these orcs are absolutely lethal to most armies and present enough damage to mostly kill you off of your own objectives. Especially if this list goes first, it can set up for an immense beta strike on the second turn with that advance and charge that most armies can't really come back from. With the loss of biggest and the best as a secondary objective, there's also no requirement for the orc warlord to be the most aggressive smash character, which means we can actually put it on this big mech with custom force field, who's gonna be relatively far back protecting your units with an invulnerable save. Next up we have Tau Empire, and the most transformative change for Tau Empire was probably the changes to aircraft. Most of the time Tau lists saw a very heavy reliance on Sun Shark bombers, but with the change to the aircraft mechanic making those bombers start the game in strategic reserve, meaning they're only gonna be able to operate on the second turn forward, the use case of the bomber where you would start it on the table, deliver a pretty crippling alpha strike to your opponent if you went first, if you went second, use Exemplar of the Montcott to put them in strategic reserves is no longer viable. They're just going to be in reserve all the time. And especially for bomber style aircraft, that's even more effective since they will no longer get the ability to bomb on the first turn. They will have to pl be placed on the table like a deep striker coming out of strategic reserve. Then the next turn they can move and declare their bombing run, which means 
the uh, damage output of those units is significantly reduced. Tau lists now are gonna be focused a little bit more on conventional combat. And this style of list is emblematic of that. We see it's using two Cold Star Commander battle suits, upgraded to the nines with relics, warlord traits, and prototype weapon systems, a crude shaper as an advanced EM scrambler caddy, a pretty effective upgrade for that shaper, giving him a 12 inch a deep strike denial aura, which is gonna be especially effective now that strategic reserves are free and a lot of armies are gonna be using either those or units it's like drop pods to alpha strike the opponent. So having this little guy in here to prevent a lot of that from doing its maximum damage is a huge deal. And we have long strike in there to provide some heavy pyre power. The rest of the list is pretty standard. We have two breacher teams in Devilfish to make use of the stratagem to disembark after the Devilfish have moved. A trio of Riptide battle suits who are able to engage from behind obscuring terrain with their ability to use their Nova Reactor to move in the charge phase instead of charging normally. That allows them to peek out of cover, take shots with their heavy burst cannons or ion accelerators accelerators and then jump back behind that line of sight blocking terrain. With a lack of armor of contempt in the meta, weapons like that heavy burst cannon are going to be lethal to space marine bodies and having that high volume, pretty decent damage weapon is certainly going to help you get out of that matchup. Especially since Space Marines tend to be range oriented as well, these Riptide Battlesuits are going to absolutely rip them apart. We also have, interestingly, a 10 model Pathfinder team with rail rifles and a recon drone. These guys do also have the ability to move and shoot uh, in and out of cover, but that requires them to fire their marker lights instead of firing their rail rifles normally. It does give you another unit that can sit in the back of the table and deliver some mortal wounds and solid damage output with those rail rifle attacks. I think the most interesting inclusion in this list are the five stealth battle suits. With crisis battle suits increasing in cost, they're going to see a little bit less play. So there's no homing, homing beacon synergy in this list to bring in crisis battle suit teams on the first turn. But what having five forward deploy models lets you do is obviously screwing out a lot of those turn one deep strikes or strategic reserves. With that combined with the advanced EM Scrambler Crude Shaper, you can actually deny a lot of turn one deep strikes like Drop Pods or Dread Claws, which keeps your Riptide battle suits safe and operating at their highest efficiency for as long as possible. Moving on to the end of the unaligned Xenos factions, we have Leagues of Votan. Although I'm not sure these count as Xenos quite so much. They get souped in with, with Xenos a lot because they don't have any other super faction keywords, but I think they're canonically just small humans. Now, the biggest benefit for Leagues of Votan in the new format is, again, that lack of requirement to take troops options. Hearthkin Warriors are a fine unit, but requirement to take 10 models per squad, they end up adding a lot of points to your army and don't really make those points back, especially with how easier they are to kill compared to the rest of the faction, sporting only one wound and a four plus save. Instead, in order to get objective secured in your list, you can focus on Hernkin Pioneers, which this list does in spades, getting three units of three of them equipped with those high last rotary cannon heavy weapons. Of the American Conglomerate increases the range of all of the range weapons, including not only the Hernkin Pioneers, but also Sagittor ATVs and these two Hecaton Land Fortresses. This gives them a pretty decent range on their bolt cannon shots, allowing the army to put a lot of damage through the center of the table. And they have those extreme range SB conversion beamers that allow you to not only beam through enemy units, but also use the American Glomerate Stratagem to do mortal wounds in addition to normal damage on beam weapons. Otherwise, the list makes use of some classic leagues of Votan combos, including a big unit of Hearthguard with Disintegrators and Concussion Grantlets and the Warp Strike Relic, allowing it to use its point-to-point -point teleportation once per game for free, costing you zero CP. We also have an interesting combo on a Kal, taking a long list as well as Grudge's End, an upgrade to his Combi Bolter. That gives it AP2 and two damage, as well as auto wounding against enemies that have judgment tokens on them. A long list also allows the Kal to fire, ignoring cover and look out, sir. And with that teleport crest allowing him as well to point-to-point -point teleport, you could potentially have that Kal draw line of sight to an enemy character, put a judgment token on it, teleport in range of his Bolter, and then fire with his AP2 ignoring cover weapon, automatically wounding and dealing two damage per shot. That gives you the ability to assassinate enemy characters, but even in situations where he's just shooting at normal base infantry, like those space marine bodies we keep talking about, he's going to be able to kill a lot of models pretty quickly from the safety of character protection. With that, we'll move on from the unaligned Xenos factions to some of the super factions, and let's start with Tyranids. The heralds of the Tyranid high fleets are the gene stealer cults, so we'll talk about them first. 
Given that Gene Stealer Cults were already a very troop-heavy faction, they don't see too many changes with the introduction of the Arcs of Omen detachment. While their points values typically remain the same, they do get free upgrade options for most of their units. While the normal operation of their list is going to be relatively similar, they do get a little bit of additional damage from units like Neophyte Hybrids, who now get to take special weapons for free. This list in particular is using a pretty classic Myriad Cult combination. The Gene Stealer Cult's custom subfaction abilities effectively give you a points allotment that you're allowed to use to buy different abilities. And the most common combinations use four one-point abilities, meaning that you're just stacking a bunch of the lowest cost and lowest impact abilities that you can. In this case, we have a custom to toil, giving the unit a stalwart effect, only able to be wounded on threes. Industrial affinity, which allows them to ignore hit penalties with their industrial weapons, mostly important for those seismic cannons that we see on a lot of these neophyte units. War convoy, which gives a six plus damage ignore on the Atalan jackals and any vehicles that are in the list as well as Synaptic Resonance. Unfortunately, Synaptic Resonance is still a little bit bork. It allows you to reroll out of perils on double ones. Not a hugely impactful effect, but, but it's mostly competing with Cold-Eyed Killers as the other one-point buy in this slot. And if you have a more Psychic-focused army, that might be worth it if you're not using that melee buff that often. Otherwise, the list is a classic Gene Stealer called Horde list, focusing on Neophyte Hybrids, rocking size mechanics to make the most benefit of that Industrial Affinity buff, as well as Adeline Jackals, to be extreme tanks. We have an Acolyte Icon Ward in the list to regenerate Adelan Jackals back into their units if the unit is not destroyed by calling the Cult into These guys have a built-in minus one to be hit and get that six plus damage ignore for more Convoy, which makes them incredibly difficult to one-shot. We also have a nine model unit of Pure Strange Gene Stealers using they came from to load to get a pre-game move, allowing them to potentially Alpha Strike or pin your opponent in their deployment zone on the top of the first turn. This also gives you the ability to screen out any forward deployers if you need it. Interestingly, we also have a Primus with the Excavate planning upgrade if the Primus starts in reserve, which is not that big of a deal for the Primus because he's able to use his command phase abilities once he's placed on the table. He allows you to replace all of the defensive keywords on a piece of terrain like light cover and defensible with difficult ground. This is incredibly good depending on the terrain format you're using. If you're using a format like the US Open terrain style, which uses big, huge blocks of area terrain, difficult ground on a 12 by 12 brick in your opponent's deployment zone can absolutely hamstring a lot of armies. Next up, we'll talk about Tyranids proper. And this is a faction that obviously is close to my heart and one that I've talked a lot about on the channel. Tyranids got a huge hit in Arcs of Omen, mostly just due to points changes and data slate update changes, making a lot of their most common combinations way more expensive. This has required Tyranids to undergo pretty significant adaptations to adapt to the new Arcs of Omen meta. And an example of that is in this list we see here. Here. Now, out of the perspective Tyranid archetypes that have been bandied about in the aftermath of their big changes, one of the most powerful ones has been a High Fleet Gorgon-style horde. This gives everything in the army 4 plus poison on all of their attacks and a floating wound reroll. The central combination of this list are these units of 15 Hormagons with Toxin Sacks and the Swarmlord. Between direct guidance from the Neurothrope to give them plus one to hit and the Swarmlord giving them a Chapter Master style effect, these Hormagons can be rerolling all of their hit rolls. If we use the Gorgon Stratagem to trigger our Toxin Sacks on 5 plus, they're hit rolls of five plus automatically wound. On top of that, they have that four plus poison, meaning they're wounding basically everything in the game on fours, despite the fact that their strength is only three. That being outside of vehicles, but the list has answers to heavy armor elsewhere, especially in that Exocrine, Maliceptor, and Shard Gullet Hive Tyrant. And with the Gorgon Psychic Power, Poisonous Influence active on them, those Hormagons also deal mortal wounds in addition to damage on wound rolls of six. This means that these little units of 15 Hormagons can do massive damage, way more than you expect them to, and use Overrun to get a maneuver secondaries like behind enemy lines. We also have additional outlets to score behind enemy lines in the Lictors and Parasite of Mortrex, both of which are very fast, and those Lictors can just use a standard Deep Strike. And we have all of that maneuverability backed up with a lot of central objective control in the big brick of 30 termagants and the Maliceptor to pulse out mortal wounds within 12 inches of it. These new styles of Tyranid lists end up being very technical and interesting to play, and I think it's definitely forced Tyranid players to dive pretty deep into the Tyranid roster to come up with effective combos. With that, we'll move on to the last of the Xenos super factions. Let's talk about Eldari with their three sub-factions, Azure Yanni, Harlequins, and Drukhari. Starting with Azure Yanni proper, these are the Craft World Eldar, and 
We're back to an old faithful. This is Hail of Doom, a blast from the past that we saw played very heavily last year when the codex was initially released. Hail of Doom effectively expands the shuriken effect of your shuriken weapon, causing them to automatically wound and automatically count as a six to wound, meaning that they get the additional AP from the shuriken weapon ability. With the reinstitution of the original version of Fire and Fade, allowing the Eldar player to spend two CP, effectively every one of their shooting phases to move one of their units after shooting. This means that these relatively short range shuriken weapon carrying units are incredibly effective and incredibly difficult to pin down given that they can just pulse in and out of line of sight, jump out of a ruin, fire their weapons, and then instead of having to roll their battle focus and get pretty big numbers, jump back behind that ruin using that fire and fade. As your Yoni armies didn't typically focus on troops units either, with the most effective units in the army being elite slots or maybe fast attack, which means that the lack of requirement that you take a bunch of troops is also super beneficial to styles of list like this. And we see that made manifest here with three units of Dire Avengers and a unit of Howling Banshees in the elite slot. We do have some Rangers in troops, mostly to score Scout the enemy, and the rest of the list being focused on an MSU style. With four Warwalkers, two Wave Serpents, two Vipers, and a unit of Wind Riders providing fire support to those big Dire Avenger bricks. We also have Azerman in there in place of any of the other Phoenix Lords, who does give objective secured to the Dire Avengers, meaning you do not have to pay the additional points to give them objective secured innately. We also have a bunch Bunch of Farseers to fuel the normal Eldar psychic powers, especially Doom and Guide, giving full heat rerolls to hit and wound and the maximum chance that we'll score those automatic sixes and get those huge AP four shots from these Dire Avengers. The other big benefit of this style of Eldari list is that the lack of Armor of Contempt means that even the standard non-rending shots from these Shuriken weapons that are usually only AP one or two are going to be punching through Marine Armor most of the time regardless. The downside here is that Hail of Doom was nerfed after its release so you no longer ignore cover with it. But we still have some classic combinations in there, like the Mark of the Incomparable Hunter and Kurnos Bow, which allows the Farseer Skyrunner to, on a six to hit, automatically inflict two mortal wounds, thanks to the combination of the Kurnos Bow, converting an attack into a mortal wound, and Mark of the Incomparable Hunter, dealing an additional mortal wound on a wound roll of six. Now that moves us on to Harlequins, another faction that was nerfed immensely in the Data Slate update. These guys lost a point of invulnerable save across every single model in the faction. And while that has has changed how the faction operates slightly. A lot of Harlequin lists mostly played on a peace trade style, and so having a 4 plus invulnerable save across the faction, that being reduced to a 5 plus, while it is a big deal, doesn't really change too much since you are expecting that your units are going to be killed most of the time on the swing back anyway. This has made it so Harlequin armies are no longer quite as focused on playing tanky, light Seda style builds and have started to dive into some of the other factions, like in this case, the Twilight Seda. This gives everything in the army the equivalent of Shock Assault, giving them plus one attack when they charge, were charged, or performed a heroic intervention. Importantly, that also gives them an additional two inches of movement on their combat moves like Pile In and Consolidate. This makes these small Harlequin player troops incredibly effective at using combat movement to dance around op opposing units and steal objectives from them with their objective secured. And to that end, we see a massive number of Harlequin troopers in this list, taking a total of seven in this detachment with a mix of different special weapons. Five of those are going to be going in the five Star Weavers that are in the list, and in addition, we have three units of Sky Weavers, a larger unit of four in order to act as a bit of a hammer, as well as two small units of two to act as harassers. On top of that, we just have a normal selection of characters, including a Solitaire, Death Jester, Troop Master, and Shadow Seer. That Troop Master, able to get the Twilight Fang Relic and the Veiled King Pivotal Roll, giving him a massive number of attacks, thanks to that Twilight Fang slowly souping up as the game continues, and the Veiled King allowing him to mood everything that is not a monster or vehicle on a 2+. Another benefit of the Twilight Sadith is the massive number of command points it ends up having, thanks to the Player of the Twilight Warlord trait that the Shadow Seer is carrying. That gives them the ability to regenerate a lot of CP over the course of the game, and fuel those special stratagems that the melee weapons and the Harlequin troop units usually rely on to deal maximum damage. Moving on to Drukhari, this is going to be the first time that we see the allied Arcs of Omen detachment mechanics being used to their full extent. 
This is with a Drukhari Real Space Raid Arcs of Omen detachment taking alongside an allied patrol detachment out of the Light Sadith. This is a big deal for Drukhari since they don't really have much of other access to Psykers. The only other way they can get a Psyker into a Drukhari army is by taking Eldari Corsairs. The downside is that those are not characters and don't unlock a lot of the secondary objectives that having a Psyker in your army would normally allow. In this case, it allows you to take a Shadow Seer and be performing something like a Psychic Interrogation or Warp Ritual in order to unlock an additional option for a secondary objective that Drukhari armies innately wouldn't normally have. Moving on to the Real Space Raid Detachment, this is a special style of detachment that Drukhari have access to that allows them to retain the sub-faction abilities of all three styles of sub-faction that Drukhari can normally take, those being Cabals, Covens, and Cults. The other requirement here is that the Archon in the detachment is upgraded to the Warlord, which means that although we have Drazar in the detachment, he's not going to be getting his Warlord trait, meaning that his damage output is significantly reduced. That Master Archon build is a classic one, though, with Ancient Evil forcing an enemy unit within three to fight last, and the Jin Blade just being a pretty solid three damage melee weapon. We also see a lot of combinations in this list to hold down the central objectives as solidly as possible. With that Alchemical Maestro Homunculus bringing the Poisoner's Ampule, which allows them to remove aura abilities from an enemy unit, both to and from them, meaning that they can no longer generate aura abilities or benefit from aura abilities for one battle round. That's especially useful when removing objective secured auras like Rites of War from a unit and not allowing you to steal objectives from them. He also has the Twisted Animator Warlord trait, which allows him to regenerate Hamoxites back to that unit of 10. And the Hamoxites have the maximum number of defensive abilities applied to them, getting a potentially 4 plus invulnerable save, situational minus 1 damage on weapons of strength 7 or less, and ignoring one failed saving throw every round. If you're not able to wipe the unit, which not many armies can, the Twisted Animator then allows the Hamunculus to regenerate D3 of them in the command phase, allowing them to potentially steal back objectives before those objectives lock in for score. We also have two units of five grotesques with that Artists of the Flesh subfaction ability, giving them the situational minus one damage as well, being followed up by a bunch of hammer units, like three units of Incubi in Raiders and Venoms, and two units of Hellions. Now that closes us out for all of the Xenos factions in the game, so we're going to be moving on to some of the more classic super factions, starting with Chaos. We'll begin discussion of this super faction with Chaos Demons, who have changed quite a bit from the Nephilim format. The unfortunate part for Chaos Demons is that they were mostly reliant on, on multiple detachments, each one dedicated to different Chaos Gods, to unlock their Warp Swarm abilities, which they no longer have access to thanks to Arcs of Omen. This means that either they're going to be hamstringing themselves on the, their unit selection by dedicating to a single god, or they're just going to be losing a lot of those Warp Swarm abilities. That said, Demon data sheets are pretty powerful, so they're still able to perform even with access to a lot of those sub-faction abilities. In this list, we do see an undivided detachment giving access to a broad selection of units from every Allegiance of Chaos God. It's being led by a Bloodthirster and Lord of Change, a classic combination of those super powerful greater demons. The Bloodthirster bringing Argath the King of Blades to ignore attack modifiers, as well as increasing the damage of his weapon by one, allowing him to swing a massive number of times with a three damage sweep attack. He's also bringing Indomitable Onslaught to have an eight wound phase cap, making him extremely difficult to remove. With 20 wounds, that means you have to be dealing somewhere around eight damage three separate times over three separate phases, which many armies don't have the option to do, especially if he's using Demonic Manifestation to teleport into the center of the table. For a permanent minus one to be wounded effect, as well as the impossible robe, to ignore one failed saving throw every phase, and we have a Transweaver in there as well to bring another Psyker, not only to buff the demon at units, but also potentially to unlock Warpcraft secondaries like Psychic Interrogation or Warp Ritual. The Lord of Change himself doesn't want to be doing that, given the fact that he has a massive bonus to cast in three separate casts. Doing Psychic Actions with that guy means you're giving up a lot of potential damage in the Psychic phase. This Demon's List is still bringing a lot of troops, given the Demon's troops are pretty good, especially at clearing enemy chaff with a unit of Blood Letters, two units of Demon Ests, and a unit of Nurgling Swarms. These guys are pretty useful, not only for the Recover the Relics mission, meaning that you will be scoring your command points on the first turn, even if you go second, and they're able to screen out some potential drops from units like Drop Pods or Dread Claws. We then focus on an MSU style, focusing on small units of these multi-wound demon infantry and beasts. Specifically, two units of five flamers who got a little bit of a debuff in the data slate, but I don't think enough to really stop them from seeing play. Their damage output for point is still some of the highest in the game, even the, given the fact that their weapon does not automatically hit anymore. However, we do have some units in this slot that saw some immense buffs in the Munitorum Field Manual update, especially those Flesh Hounds, giving you some of the most efficient multi-wound ground troops that the game has seen in a really long time. 
For 15 points a model, these little units of 5 give you a grand total of 16 attacks. At strength 5, AP 2, 2 damage in the first round of combat. They give you a deny, access to a 3 plus deny, thanks to the corn strat contempt for sorcery, and are just generally difficult to remove with two wounds apiece and that demonic invulnerability save. Interestingly, the unit champion in each of these units is equipped with a flamer as well, a D6 shot, range 12, strength four, AP one, auto hitting weapon, which is kind of a nice added benefit. Moving on into the chaos super faction, we have chaos knights. This style of chaos knights is a little bit different from the ones that we've seen in past formats, given that it's no longer relying on one or two of the big heavy knights in order to act as a very difficult to kill core of the army. Instead, this list is focused on spamming as many small war dog knights into the list as we can. It's using House Herpetrank, giving all of the war dogs a bonus of plus two wounds, and is one of the iconoclast households, giving them a melee bonus in the first round of combat. We see a lot of individual combos on these war dogs, including the Mirror of Fates for CP regen and Helm of Warp Sight on an Executioner. This allows him to fire while ignoring cover and hit roll modifiers on the double auto cannons of the Executioner war dog. We have one war dog carnivore upgraded with the Helm of Dogs and Blood Shield. Shield, granting that guy an attack bonus, aura of reroll ones to wound, as well as a once per game ability to ignore invulnerable saves. That's followed up by a bunch of war dog stalkers stacking some defensive technology, including beguiling majesty, giving the war dog itself a minus one to hit and wound in melee, and a potential minus one attack aura if it ever unlocks its favorite ability, and an aura of corruption, giving an aura that reduces enemy strength. This means that these war dogs can be a little bit tougher to kill than you expect, and given the fact that they all count as five objective secured models, that is pretty important. Now, interestingly, we also see this list make use of the allied detachment mechanics. Because it is a chaos army, it allows you to take a chaos knight detachment as one of your allied detachments. And in this case, it's just, it's taking another chaos knight detachment. The benefit here is that this allows you to take Dread Blades in addition to whatever your normal sub-faction is. This gives the list three additional War Dog Driggit... Driggins? This gives the list access to three additional War Dog Brigands using the Biomechanical Form sub-faction ability. That gives them the Demonic Surge ability, allowing them to take damage in exchange for a random buff and gives them a four plus save against any damage they take in exchange for that. Classically, we saw this style of list bringing in a character like Abaddon in a Supreme Command detachment. However, with the loss of detachment mechanics from the previous formats, you can no longer take Supreme Command detachments, meaning it's very difficult to get Abaddon into a non-Heretic Astartes army. Now, speaking of Heretic Astartes, let's talk about the big spiky power armored men themselves. Previously, Emperor's Children was one of the most effective armies, not only in the Heretic to Kastari sub-faction, but potentially in the whole game. And while the overall faction has seen some decrease in power level, thanks to changes not only to Armor of Contempt, but also in the Munitorum Field Manual, Emperor's Children is still going strong as probably one of the most effective Chaos Space Marine Legion options. In this case, we have a pure Emperor's Children Arcs of Omen detachment, bringing a winged Demon Prince with the Flames of Spite and Mantle of Trainers combo, allowing him to get full hit and wound rerolls in melee. Interestingly, we also see Lucius the Eternal making an appearance. This guy, I think, got overshadowed by Abaddon in previous builds of the list, but is actually an absolutely sick melee combatant. With his Warlord trait active, he gets full hit rerolls in melee, reduces the attacks of enemy models within one inch, has a three inch targetable fight line last and gets a ton of extra attacks and damage against enemies with a three plus weapon skill, which is like 90% of the units in the game. That gives him a grand total of eight strength five AP three, three damage swings if he has that duelist pride ability active. He also has a situationally two damage AP three flamer weapon and some additional abilities that are just icing on the cake. It's cool to see Lucius the Eternal back on the table because for 120 points, this guy is actually an absolute steal. The core of this list is a boatload of noise marines, rocking as many blast masters as humanly possible. Given that these weapons do extreme damage with their very long range, 48 or 36 inch shots, and the bonus of plus one damage at half range, meaning that most of the table is gonna be within that radius to get that damage bonus. We also see a little bit of an evolution from previous versions of the list with the classic 10 model cast Terminator brick being replaced with instead a possessed brick. With the loss of armor of contempt and a points cost increase, the terminators don't look quite as good in the comparison with possessed. The black rune of damnation on the, is on these guys to give them minus one to be wounded. And importantly, given the fact that they're demon kin, they are targetable by the honor of the prince stratagem, giving them super easy charges. Last but not least, we have a unit that's been seeing 
increased play since the transition of formats to decimators. These guys bring soul burner petards, just allowing them to convert damage directly into normal wounds. Very good against heavily armored enemies. Moving on to the more esoteric legion specific armies. We're gonna start with Death Guard. Now, in my opinion, these guys aren't doing so hot given all of the changes to the data slate, but they do have some benefits and some combos that can still work pretty well. The core of most current Death Guard armies is gonna be this brick of Plague Marines. We see most armies bringing multiple units of five to 10 model Plague Marines, given the fact that they do get free weapon upgrades. So for relatively reasonable points cost, these units are rocking plasma guns, power fists, blight launchers, melta guns, and a bevy of melee weapons. Another benefit in the transition was Blight Lord Terminators, who got free ranged weapon upgrades. Upgrades, allowing these 10 model Blight Lord Terminator Brecks who put a ton of very difficult to chew through ranged damage on the table, bringing multiple combi meltas, Blight Launchers, and again, an interesting selection of melee attacks. Alongside Tally Men to give these models plus one to hit and potentially exploding sixes if you've taken the Toll Keeper Relic, that makes these big bricks of Terminators pretty lethal when it comes not only to range, but also melee attacks. Arch Contaminator from the Biologus Putrefire also gives these units rerolls with ranged attacks within half range or melee attacks. The other combo that we have here is taking the Ferryman Subfaction, which gives you the ability to extend aura abilities by six inches. This affects not only that Arch Contaminator aura, but also the Foul Blight Spawn, who has the ability to count enemy units as not having charge if they charge into its aura. That means that your units have the potential to swing first and removes any charge buff effects like Shock Assault. To add a little bit of maneuverability to the list, we have these Blight Drones and Bloat Drones. The Fetid Bloat Drones are excellent as a harassment unit, given that they can potentially be heroically intervening six inches. So if they are towed onto the effective area of an objective marker by about an inch and a half, they can effectively heroically intervene to anywhere on that objective. The Blight Drone is also another interesting include. While their damage output isn't particularly exciting, they do have a 14-inch movement, one of the highest movement characteristics for anything in the Death Guard faction. Next up, let's cover Thousand Suns. And in a little bit of a convergent evolution, these guys end up looking kind of like a lot of these Death Guard Plague Marine builds. Thousand Suns also lost Armor of Contempt, which dramatically reduced the survivability of a lot of their heavier units like Scarab Occult Terminators, especially since in a lot of cases they could be combining that with their All is Dust ability to give them a save bonus against one damage weapons. This meant that you'd have to punch through AP three or four with a one damage weapon to reduce these Scarab Occult Terminators even to a three plus save, which many armies couldn't do. And dealing with multiple units of Scarab Occults was very difficult. Now, without access to that Armor of Contempt, Scarab Occults are a little bit easier to kill. So we're gonna be seeing a lot of lists move towards this style of Rubric Marine spam. Rubric Marines are an incredibly effective troops option. Not only do they give you high AP ranged weapons, either with Warp Flamers, Soul Reaper Cannons, or their normal Inferno Bolters, which is especially effective given the lack of Armor of Contempt on enemy Marines, while those Rubrics are still going to be benefiting situationally from a similar effect thanks to All is Dust, but they also give you Psychic Powers and additional Cabal Points thanks to their Icons of Flame. This list is bringing a pretty classic combination of characters, including an Infernal Master, two Exalted Sorcerers, and Aramon on his disc, alongside a massive kit of seven units of Rubric Marines. One of them being a unit of 10 with Warp Flamers to be able to jump around thanks to Sorceress Facade, giving them a reposition effect and just absolutely destroy a unit with those big Warp Flamer bombs. A couple of smaller units with Warp Flamers as well as several units just with Inferno Bolters, Soul Reaper Cannons, and Temporal Surge. That Temporal Surge gives the unit a Warp Time effect allowing them to move again in the Psychic phase, giving them the ability to put a lot of pressure on objectives. With five objective secured models running at you full speed, a lot of armies aren't able to kill them fast enough and they're able to contest or control your objectives. We still have that one huge Scarab Occult Terminator brick of 10 models with missile racks and Soul Reaper cannons. Interestingly, these guys have had all of the buffs put on them, including Rites of Coalescence, allowing one of those Scarab Occults to heal back to full each of your command phases. So if any of those models aren't fully removed, they'll heal back up to the top. That combos with Warped Regeneration, allowing you to return one of those Scarab Occult Terminators to the unit. If the attached Sorcerer manifests a psychic power with a result of nine or more. Given some of the warp charge manipulation effects that Thousand Suns can have, they can potentially be forcing the psychic test result of a smite power up to nine or more and then use the Cabal ability to auto pass it. So this is actually a pretty active combo for this unit. And with that, we are on to the biggest super faction in the game, the armies of the Imperium, starting with Adeptus Sororitas. Now Adeptus Sororitas didn't change too much from the previous version of the game to Arcs of Omen. They did lose Armor of Contempt, but given 
the style of army that Adeptus Rorotas typically played. While that did mean that their more tanky builds using sub-factions like Valorous Heart are going to be less effective, the standard build using Order of the Bloody Rose is still perfectly fine. Outside of characters, most Adeptus Rorotas units that make contact with the enemy are not expected to survive, so the fact that they're a little bit easier to kill, similar to Harlequins, doesn't impact their effectiveness all that much. Adeptus Rorotas are a faction that is front-loaded on offensive output rather than defensive, so losing a little bit of armor save, not that big of a deal. In this case, we see a very classic Order of the Bloody Rose build, featuring a smattering of characters, including a Cannoness with Mantle of Ophelia to reduce incoming damage to one, making her very difficult to deal with. She also has Blazing Ire, giving her rerolls in melee and the ability to advance and charge, which allows her to get in range to use Word of the Emperor, forcing enemies to fight last and potentially removing their invulnerable saves. The biggest change here is that we see two units of Celestian Sacrosons alongside a Dogmata to give them objective secured. This gives the army a relatively resilient brick of models in the center to potentially hold down a center objective. For the most part, though, we're gonna be focusing on these MSU style of offensive units, including two units of Sisters Repentia, backed up by a Repentia Superior, three units of Zephyrim, one of five and two of eight, and two units of five Retributors. We can keep any of these small ground units in Sorota has rhinos and bloody rose have the ability to pre-game move those rhinos allowing you to deliver potentially devastating retributor or sister repentia alpha strikes to enemies that aren't set up to, to receive them. Next up, we have Adeptus Custodes, who is probably one of the most improved Imperial sub-factions from the Nephilim format. They saw a bunch of nerfs that were delivered back in the beginning of last year to curb the power of the army reversed. And while they're not back to their full original power, they do have objectives secured across the majority of their army, just not all of their infantry, only their core infantry. So effectively everything but characters, which gives them a lot of primary objective control. This style style of list is going to be one that we see pretty often, focusing pretty heavily on not only custodian guard squads, but also custodian wardens. Given that those guys get a little bit of an offensive buff without losing that objective secured, that in the previous rule set you would have been giving up for taking them. We also have a shield captain in Alaris Terminator armor, bringing the impregnable mind and Praetorian plate combo. This allows this guy to potentially heroically intervene effectively anywhere on the table once per game. Use Unstoppable Destroyer to pile in and consolidate any direction, as long as he ends in engagement range of enemy models. And then, with that impregnable mind, count himself as four models holding an objective. While he himself isn't objective secured, if he heroically intervenes into an ongoing combat that already contains objective secured models itself, he can often be standing next to a singleton Alaris custodian or a couple custodian guards and be potentially swapping control of an objective. We also have a shield captain on John Eagle Jetbike as a little bit of an assassin. He's bringing Lock Warden to ignore invulnerable saves on characters and the warlord himself, Trajan Valoris. From there, we're focused on this MSU style with four units of three custodian guards, two units of three custodian wardens, and two individual Alarius custodians, just adding a breadth of small objective secured units that a lot of armies are going to have trouble individually taking down. And that followed up by the real hammer of the army, two units of Virtus Praetors with salvo launchers. If your opponent's playing very cagey, you can threaten objective control with these small individual units in this army. And then once they're forced to expose themselves dealing with those little infantry units, the Virtus Praetors can let loose and deal massive damage with those salvo launchers and their incredible melee attacks. This is another army that benefits supremely from the last of Armor of Contempt on Space Marine bodies, given the fact that their AP is generally good, but not enough to entirely remove Space Marine armor saves. However, their damage output is usually good enough. So the fact that Space Marines were saving about 50% more often against them with Armor of Contempt no longer matters, and they're going to be doing a lot more damage against that style. Next up, we'll move to another highly improved army that we haven't been seeing in the Nephilim season almost at all, given that they were one of the worst performing armies in the game. But I think we're going to be seeing a lot more now, thanks to some of the upgrades that this faction has gotten. This is Adeptus Mechanicus. This style of Adeptus Mechanicus is very different than from the ones we've seen previously. I think one of the various builds we're going to be seeing is a Lucius Forge World, really tanky range focus build, but the other benefit that Mechanicus got was the core keyword on those Cataphron units, including Breachers and Destroyers. And this example of a list makes massive use of that. This army is using the Ryza of Forge World, which gives it a really broad spectrum of offensive options. Ryza gives plus one to wound on the charge in melee, a charge bonus and a stratagem for a bonus damage on plasma weapons. That's especially effective on that big brick of Cataphron Destroyers with Plasma Culverins. We also have a bunch of buffs that are now available to target those models with, given the fact that they are now core keyworded. 
This includes Raymond of the Techno Martyr to ignore hit roll and ballistic skill modifiers, Artisan's ability to allow the unit to fall back and shoot with minus one to hit. However, obviously Raymond will allow you to ignore that. And we have some tanky options, including the low guy ability to ignore AP one and two, and the advanced janitor's ability to give them a six plus damage ignore. On top of that, Ryza also has that focus on melee attacks. And not only is that gonna be useful on units like Catafron Breachers, who also bring a melee weapon in addition to their ranged weapon, but also on these massive numbers of Sicarians, with three units of 10 Sicarian Rust Stalkers and two units of five Infiltrators. These guys have access to Citation and Savagery, giving them plus one AP and melee, the Omniscient Mask, giving one of them exploding sixes in melee, the Janitor's first ability, giving them Gene Rot Might, and Supervisory Radiance for reroll hit rolls. In addition to that charge buff that we have and wound bonus from Ryza, these guys are absolutely lethal. Despite the fact that we've lost access access to a lot of the stratagems that they previously had from the Skitari veteran cohort. That's still going to allow the army to operate in multiple phases with those Cataphrons doing absolutely immense damage in the shooting phase and able to tank quite a bit with high armor saves and those defensive effects that we discussed earlier, followed up by Sicarians, not only in Scorpius Dune Riders, but also the Terex Pattern Termite, or just forward deploying thanks to those infiltrators. Moving on, we have a faction that looks to be a little bit of a boogeyman in the Arcs of Bowman meta. This is Astra Militarum. Now, interestingly, while I think a lot of Astra Militarum lists are going to be using the Born Soldiers sub-faction ability, this example list in particular is not. Instead, going for a real Talarn style of sub-faction combo, using Swift as the Wind for plus one to two movement, depending on the type of unit that it's affecting, and plus one on charge rolls, as well as Armored Superiority to count all of the vehicles as multiple models for holding objectives. Now, the lack of Born Soldiers not only makes the army a little bit worse at shooting, but also restricts its use of the Kazurkin combo I discussed in a previous video. Now, to be fair, Kazurkin are a very cheap unit and don't really need the full combo to be very effective. The full combo dealing a potential 18 mortal wounds spread across a couple different enemy units. I discussed it in depth in a previous video, so you can go check it out over there. The other benefit that this has, however, is if the expected nerf occurs to the, the full Kazurkin combo, this army will actually be probably uh, entirely immune. That said, we still have Lord Solar Leontis in the list to point at any of these units and give them full hit and wound rerolls not only making it so that Kaiser can still deal pretty immense damage, especially to a single target, but he can also target one of the three units of Adeline Rough Riders in the army. Lord Solar also has the ability of knowing every single order, so he can potentially be giving units like these Adeline Rough Riders or Kazurkin objectives secured. One of the Kazurkin units in the army has the Heirloom Weapons subfaction ability alongside the Barbican's Key Relic. This gives them an additional four inches of range to their ranged weapons and allows them a once per game redeploy, letting them deep strike up into your opponent's face, get in rapid fire range for their volley gun and plasma guns, and let loose with massive damage. The other unit has the mechanized subfaction ability, meaning it's going to start in that Chimera, and allows the unit to disembark after the Chimera moves. Unfortunately, there aren't any officers also available to be embarked in that Chimera, so we can't make use of the combination where we will also be ordering that unit once it disembarks, but it will probably be moving far enough to get up in half range of enemies anyway, so not many auras are particularly useful. That's followed up with an absolutely massive number of vehicles, including four Lehman Russ, backed up by a tank commander, four scout sentinels, one in a brick of three and one in a, as a singleton, and a death strike missile launcher. Now, I talked about all the weird mechanics of the death strike missile in a previous video as well. I highly recommend you go check that out. I also talk about some of the lore behind death strike missile launchers, which is pretty new for me, so very exciting. But this generally will threaten an enormous aura of massive mortal wound damage onto your opponent's army and force them to move out of cover into the waiting guns of those Lehman Russ executioners. Now, moving on to some of the more esoteric Imperial sub-factions, we have the Demon Hunters themselves, Grey Knights. And the first thing I have to say about this list is that Nemesis Dread Knights are back, baby. We are back to playing the Sword Bearers sub-faction, giving enormous benefits to these vehicle units. Now, a little bit of an interesting idiosyncrasy of Grey Knights is that because of the wording of their restriction on Grandmaster Nemesis Dread Knights, they're actually unable to take multiple of them in their Arcs of Omen detachment. This list in particular is bringing a Brotherhood Tech Marine with the Unyielding Anvil Aura, giving core units objective secured. This lets him babysit the Nemesis Dread Knights, repair them, give them plus one to hit, and give them that objective secured as well. So the big battleship that is three Nemesis Dread Knights can wander around the table with a massive number of buffs. Interestingly, he also has the Omen of Incursion, which allows you once per game to 
perform an Auspex scan style interrupt and shoot at a unit deep striking or coming in out of reserve. With those free strategic reserves now available to every faction in the game, I actually think there's going to be a lot of reserves happening, so that Omen of Incursion is actually very useful. We have a Brotherhood Librarian with the classic Mortal Wound combination, bringing Purifying Flame, Vortex of Doom, and Psychic Epitome. That lets you either naturally deep strike this guy or use a Gate of Infinity to port him around the table, do enormous numbers of Mortal Wounds, and now use his free Combi Melt to add some additional damage, with Psychic Epitome increasing the Mortal Wounds dealt by his Psychic Powers. The benefit here is that, that he will score Teleport Strike if he's able to kill an enemy unit, if you have set him up on the table thanks to that Teleportation or Gate of Infinity. Alongside the Dread Knights potentially teleporting around the table as well, you actually have a lot of options to score that secondary, which makes up for a little bit of the fact that their normally powerful secondary, Ritual Purification, has been significantly nerfed. Following that up, we have a pretty classic combination of Grey Knights units, including one Strike Squad, three Interceptor Squads, two of five and one of ten, that will most likely be combat squatting into two additional units of five, especially with a lack of armor of contempt and these guys having two damage melee weapons. These guys will trade with a lot of opposing space marine bodies extremely efficiently. With their small footprint and high movement, they can usually just wait around the radius of an objective, force your opponent to move onto it, and then jump out and kill an opposing space marine unit very easily. We also have a purgation squad making use of those free weapon upgrades now with four side cannons, just giving you a little bit of an additional shooting battery that you can potentially be jumping around the table with Gave Infinity as well. All right, moving on to the other kind of knights that we have in the Imperial Super Faction, Imperial Knights. These guys are looking incredibly strong in the Arcs of Omen season. Now, I think the downside for them, and one of the reasons that we haven't been seeing too many of the big knights being played in the Chaos Knights list that we saw earlier, is that uh, there are, is going to be a lot of shooting in this meta, and there's going to be a lot of very powerful gun lines. We talked about Tau already, Astra Militarum, all of them bringing four or five big, heavy anti-tank weapons, and that certainly hurts Imperial Knights, but they are one of the tankiest factions in the game, so they might be able to survive that. The big benefit of Imperial Knights here is incredible access to secondary objectives. They have some of the highest scoring and easiest to score secondaries in the entire game, and that's a pretty big benefit for them, especially in a game where the comparison of secondary objectives oftentimes will define a matchup between two factions. This list in particular is using a House Tyrannus build. This gives them a 6 plus damage ignore roll against non-mortal wounds. They've taken Defend the Realm and Lay Low the Tyrants as their oaths, giving them an additional CP every battle round, potential objective security if they're able to unlock all of the abilities, as well as a Master Artisan style hit or wound reroll, and a potential auto 6 from Lay Low the Tyrants. The list in particular is bringing a reasonable number of armagers, including three Warglaives and one Helverin, as well as three big knights to back them up. The Night Crusader in the list is running the Relic, Gatling Cannon, Endless Fury, giving them a D6 plus 12 shot AP3 weapon. Incredibly good at killing a lot of these Space Marine bodies that we've been talking about. It's getting additional shots on its Heavy Stubbers, thanks to Blessed Arms, and thanks to Knight of Mars, gives it an additional ability to get an automatic roll of six. This can combo with the additional auto six from Lalo the Tyrants, and both of them can be used on the Thermal Cannon to ensure that it converts attacks from that enormous melta gun. The Gallant is bringing Master of Lore, giving it a Litany for a 5 or 6 plus damage ignore roll on armagers within 6 inches, and the ability to stack its bondsmen abilities with other knights. Combined with the Crusader, this can give plus 1 weapon skill and ballistic skill, or that plus 1 to hit effect and reroll 1s to hit and wound, thanks to the combination with the Paladin. Speaking of the Paladin, this guy is bringing the Princeps upgrade, allowing him to give the, those hit and wound rolls of 1 to other big knights, in addition to just the smaller armagers. Overall, it'll be interesting to see how knights' lists end up constructing themselves themselves. I do think that singleton knight lists that focus on those armagers are going to be very effective, but the downside there is if those knights do get taken out by anti-tank shooting, the armagers will suffer quite a bit. An unbondsmaned armager is leagues easier to kill and does significantly less damage than an armager fully charged by the aura abilities of those big knights. So, all right, that brings us to her last faction. We're almost at the end of the video, everybody. This has been a super long one, but we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite faction, good old Space Marines. The new face of Space Marines is most likely going to be Iron Hands, who have the most to benefit from all of the changes made to the faction's abilities from the Data Slate update. We will see a couple lists coming out of Blood Angels and some similar sub-factions, but I do think that Iron Hands is going to be the big boogeyman for the time being. 
Now this, um, now this new Space Marine meta is incredibly offensively oriented and built around a core combining heavy weapon, infantry, conventional vehicles, and dreadnoughts. Uh, and this list in particular is a great example of that. We have a lieutenant to grant. We have a lieutenant to grant wound rerolls, and sometimes you'll also see this guy rocking rights of war to give the Redemptor dreadnoughts objective secured. But given the fact that most of your weapons in your army are going to be heavy weapons, you're already rerolling your hit rolls of one, meaning that captains or even the wisdom of the ancients aura from your dreadnoughts is not really required. We have a tech marine to give one of these vehicles plus one to hit, most likely the relic contemptor dreadnought once the full combo is assembled, as well as adept of the omniscia to heal an additional wound when he goes to repair, and the ironstone to reduce incoming damage on one of the vehicles. Most likely this will be either one of the storm speeders or gladiators, whatever is pushing up forward, since the ability doesn't combo with the dreadnoughts built in duty eternal uh, minus one damage effect. We have a couple infiltrators to add some objective secured and deep strike defense, as well as that brick of redemptors to form the core of the army. One with an onslaught Gatling cannon and one with a macro plasma. I've talked about the Relic Contemptor a lot on this channel in previous coverage of Iron Hands lists, and this is certainly one of the biggest benefits you get from playing Iron Hands, and maybe one of the most powerful single models in the entire game. The full combination is getting plus one to hit on this guy from the Tech Marine, combined with the built-in super doctrine effect of reroll ones to hit on heavy weapons. This Relic Contemptor is gonna be hitting on twos and rerolling those ones. Thanks to Merciless Logic, it's sixes to hit, also, generate additional attacks. You do have to reroll to hit with these ones, but given that you're hitting on twos and rerolling ones, the chance that you miss on those is pretty unlikely. In addition to these 16 shots with all of that explosions from the twin Volkite Culverins, we also have two shots from the Cyclone Missile Launcher at D6 damage apiece. All of them with plus one AP thanks to being in permanent Devastator Doctrine. Last but certainly not least, we can use all Mercy's weakness to also give exploding wound rolls on this model's many attacks, and that allows you to pulse out a bunch of mortal wounds thanks to the twin Volkite Culverins, the exploding attacks obviously don't generate mortal wounds themselves, but will force additional AP1 saves, which are more effective thanks to the lack of armor of contempt. Even high armor save targets are going to be taking some conventional damage from those shots in addition to stacked mortal wounds. And all of that shooting from behind character protection, sending behind two Redemptor Dreadnoughts and three Gladiators, because March of the Ancients gives that Relic Contemptor the character keyword, and he is below 10 wounds. That's followed up by two units of Devastators in a drop pod. A big benefit of these models is that they can now come down basically any turn and ignore the move and shoot penalty, whereas previously you had to bring them in on the first turn so that they benefited from Devastator Doctrine and the Iron Hands Super Doctrine effect. Now that you can stay in Devastator Doctrine for the entire game, they can come in up to Battle Round 3 and still get all of those buffs. Iron Hands could always put units back into Devastator Doctrine thanks to Methodical Firepower, but you couldn't target a unit that was embarked in a drop pod with that stratagem, which significantly reduced the expected damage from Devastators if they weren't coming in on the first turn. Now, if your opponent is screening out your first turn drops, you can just clear away their screen and then push in that drop pod later on in the game. We have a couple Eradicators with heavy weapons as well, getting those heavy weapon upgrades for free and again, getting all of the Super Doctrine benefits from being Iron Hands and followed up by three Gladiator Reapers. I talked about these guys in my most improved Space Marine units video, and I think that for 150 points on a T8 body with the potential defensive effects from Ironstone, Gladiator Reapers have some of the most efficient high volume firepower in the Space Marine faction right now. Iron Hands also have the benefit of having an incredibly powerful secondary objective. So being able to basically lock in their faction specific secondary, as well as Codex Warfare to get points for destroying units with heavy weapons because they're going to be sitting in Devastator Doctrine all game. In addition to having some of the highest damage shooting, they also have some incredibly effective secondaries that really benefit their shooting style. This is why Iron Hands is probably going to be one of the strongest armies in the game, at least the strongest Space Marine chapter. And with that, that is every army in 40k right now. While there is going to be some evolution to these lists, I think a lot of lists, at least for the time being, are going to look very similar to the ones that I talked about in this video. If there's any list archetypes you thought I missed, or there's any particular list that you're excited to see or play in Arcs of Omen, let me know down in the comments. And let me know down in the comments if you want me to dive in to this topic a little bit farther, talk about maybe Space Marine chapters or Chaos Space Marine Legions, something like that. Thanks so much for watching all the way through the video, all the way to the end. Big thanks to everyone who supports the channel as well, either over on Patreon on at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise youtube channel members twitch subscribers all you people are great and big thanks to captain con for sponsoring this video i hope you either tune into my live coverage here on february 4th through 5th or you come visit me i'll be there all weekend uh either playing games or streaming games so it's gonna be sweet i'm psyched and with that we'll wrap up the video remember to keep it classy folks and have happy wargaming